Buenos días, mi nombre es Tomás. Good morning. I am Tomás Ruiz. Sánchez, professor for transport and mobility at the Political University of Valencia and also the director of the chair Transport and Society, which is collaborating with the regional government for the territorial policy, public works and territorial structure. And this webinar is the first of a series of webinars and we'll be talking about the Mediterranean Corridor, a European project. Well, increasingly a reality rather than a project with the object to, con to connect the north and the south of Europe. Always based on railway, which is the most sustainable way of transport. This project is a seminal one for the whole Mediterranean region in Spain, especially for the Valencia region. Before we introduce our speakers, I like to tell the audience that you can ask questions through the chat box and through the chat on YouTube. We will pass them on to the speakers today. And for the first speaker, Iveta Radikova, the questions will be asked as soon as she finishes her speech. So now I will introduce this very important panel to get more familiar with this project. Iveta Radikova is the director of the Communication University at the Pan-European University in Slovakia and also working in Bratislava at the International School of Liberal Arts. Between 2010 and 2012, she was first minister of the Republic of Slovakia, and currently she is the European coordinator of the Mediterranean Corridor. Josep Vicent Boyda is a professor of human geography at the UV in 2015. In 2018, he was the regional secretary for housing, public works, and territorial structure. And today, he is the coordinator of the Mediterranean Corridor project in Spain. And to introduce the webinar, we'll give the floor to Arcadi España, who is the regional councillor for territorial policy, public works, and mobility in the Valencian regional government. Well, thank you very much, Tomás, and thank you, everyone, with us today, especially the speakers and Tomás as a moderator and coordinator, Josep Vicent Boira, also the commissioner for the Mediterranean Corridor, Ms. Radikova, who is the European coordinator of the Mediterranean Corridor. Yesterday, we celebrated the Day of Europe, and if you will allow me, Spaniards and Valencians, we were European, Europeanists before the institutions existed. I should remember the Valencians without speaking any other language than Spanish or Valencian. They used to go to Spain to sell their oranges many years ago, and that was the start of this Europeanism that we've always felt very close to our hearts. And this is not just uh, of an economic nature, but also of a cultural nature. Looking towards Europe always meant freedom and progress for Spain. So we've opened this series of conferences to celebrate the European Year of Railroad Transport and to talk about the Mediterranean Corridor. And this is also about culture and in such a difficult situation in the world. The COVID-19 crisis has rocked our boats and our consciences and our concerns, and, but we are drawing important lessons. First, the need for a new model for transport and logistics. We've seen the tensions, the frictions between European countries when it comes to having all the health care products in the most acute moments of the crisis. Also, we felt the crisis of just-in-time, and now we need a more regionalized globalization, which is also more elastic and which is more permeable for these shocks. And that's why it's increasingly important, this infrastructure, the Mediterranean corridor. There is a wide consensus nowadays in the Valencia region and in Spain on the need for this corridor, which will be key to reactivate economically Valencia, Spain, and Europe.
This is our vision for transport and logistics to strengthen the importance of the railway, which is sustainable, safe, and always innovative. Also, with new loads and new controls on origin is the most is the safest and the most sustainable so transport as we know amount for 25 to 27 percent of the uh, co2 emissions and railway only amounts for one percent of those emissions but we have a handicap in spain especially here regarding the railway railway transport with very low rates in Europe and especially low in Spain. So it's the time for the boost to the railway so that we have a model distribution of transport by road and by railway. It's true that the pandemic was a huge blow for everyone, but luckily the European response was different than in other crises. It was a coordinated response, a sustainable one, an inclusive response with a framework of a job creation policy and also contributing to the territorial structure as per the Next Generation Fund with 140 billion euros for Europe and Spain and focusing on sustainable mobility and safe mobility and also connected mobility and that's why the European corridors for transport meet its function as the backbone for transport and as the warranties for a fair distribution also the corridor is one of the most ambitious projects in Europe and Spain and in Valencia starting north of Africa and reaching the center of Europe. Also, to conclude, I'd like to highlight that this is, this is everyone's project, not just uh, that of the regions that are touched by the corridor at the economical, economic level is directly linked with economic growth of all territories, also with an expansive boost on the GDP with a ratio of 1 to 3.5 uh, euros per euro invested, also connecting the east and west uh, borders, and it will, will, convert, will turn into a route that will bring closer territories. And also, regarding the environment, it will contribute to reduce, importantly, the effect of climate change. For our country, this is an infrastructure connecting four regions. 50% of our wealth, 60% of our exports, and 65% of maritime transport and shipping. According to, a, to the latest report of the European coordinator, Ms. Radikova, if this becomes a reality, the Mediterranean corridor, the GDP in Spain could increase 2.2% by 2030. Lastly, for the Valencia region, as I said before, as a clear exporting vocation with two thirds of exports going towards the continent and 50% of imports coming from the EU. But we still have some handicaps. For example, the Valencia, Sagunt, Alacant, and other ports are not connected to the European gauge. So we need to overcome those barriers. And we need to do more. Here, I would like to thank the Chair for Transport and Society for the study on boosting the transport, the railway transport in the region to see which synergies we can strike up and what we can do in the region to bring down the gap between the railway transport and other type of transports in Europe. That's the motto, the main idea of the European Green uh, agreement that goes beyond the economics. It's affecting the daily lives of the citizens that will be, will be using the high-speed train and multiplying the investment and job creation opportunities. As I said before, Spain and the Valencia region have always been very Europeanist, even before the institution's existence. Be witness to that is Ignacio de Villalonga, who in 19 18, 
forecasted the importance of the Mediterranean corridor, saying that there would be a railway along the Mediterranean with Val Valencia through Catalonia, south of France, connecting amongst others Murcia. And that was back in 1918. A lot of water has gone under the bridge, and well, we see the end at the, at the la we see the light at the end of the tunnel. And for us, the corridor is not just uh, an infrastructure; it's a corridor for progress and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear councillor, for your introductory remarks. And now, we will give the floor to Miss Iveta Radikova. Iveta. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure to have a chance to be with you and talk. And especially, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Councillor for such a words and supportive words for uh, Mediterranean Corridor. Um, I can only add that, yes, uh, corridor and transport is not only important because of single market, transport of goods and passengers and connection of, of Europe, but in the time of globalization, time of climate change, yes, with a terrible impact of pandemia on Europe, uh, it's part also of very important uh, European Green Deal. I have to stress that, except that, uh, as you have mentioned already, transport sector is responsible for 25% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but more, it, it, transport is the only major energy consuming sector in which emissions have increased rather than decreased over the last three decades. Uh, the European Green Deal calls for 90 percentage reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for, from transport in order for the EU to become a climate neutral economy by 2050, uh, while also working towards zero pollution ambition. To achieve this systematic change, we need to, first of all, make all transport modes more sustainable, make sustainable alternatives widely available in a multimodal transport system, and last but not least, and uh, put in place the right incentives to drive the transition. Reduction of transport emissions by 90 percentage by 2050 cannot be achieved without a proper 10T network, network allowing for green transport. And it calls in particular for striving rail transport system. Uh, we have to have in our mind that on, not only trucks are uh, totally preoccupied on our, our roads, but also uh, airplanes connections uh, with emissions and pollution. Uh, so the future is really our connection based on high speed uh, railways. The 10 guidelines are setting clear and binding targets for the development of multimodal and interoperable transport networks in Europe. Plus, TNT regulation introduced common standards and implementation deadlines for the core TNT network by 2030. And I have to stress, it's only nine years we have all together uh, to really um, have a high speed activities, not only high-speed railways. Um, TENTI also defines uh, the role and my role as European coordinator. Uh, my role is to facilitate the joint efforts of the member state, states along the TENTI corridors, forging 
a common vision and action plan to eliminate bottlenecks, to bridge the missing links and improve the quality standards in the corridor network. I would like to thank for very close and friendly and a very uh, working cooperation with Jose Boira, the Spanish coordinator of the Mediterranean Corridor, to whom I really would like to thank, thank, thank for excellent cooperation. If we have such connections and cooperation uh, in each member state, uh, uh, I am sure <clears throat> we are better prepared to fulfill our common aim. Uh, what I would like to stress is that the investment from both sides, member states and EU in Europe needs to be enormous and they are enormous. Just to complete the 10T core network and build it as a truly multimodal system, three 100 billion euros are needed over the next 10 years. It's not a small amount, but let me tell two examples. Uh, only extensions of London underground with 42 kilometers of tunnels and 10 new stations will cost Great Britain approximately 20 billion euros only underground in london another example high speed train in california which is 1300 kilometers but with the train with the speed 320 kilometers per hour they are prepared to spend more than 50 billion euro only on this one railway connection so if we compare how quickly and fast uh, different countries are working on uh, modernization of their transport together with Green Deal, uh, 300 million billion euros for interconnection of all our continent all together uh, seems not to be uh, not adequate cost for benefits we can see at the end. And openly, Europe uh, and EU is not poor union. Um, we are geopolitical major uh, player. A key instrument of the EU to contribute in filling uh, the investment gap is the sure connecting, connecting Europe facility. Uh, this concentrates its support to projects which will directly be benefit um, our model shift ambitions. More than 23 billion euros have been invested in the period 2014 to 2020, with about 70 percentage dedicated to rail. For the pre period 2021-2027, Connecting Europe facility will make available more than 25 billion euros for transport projects. I repeat, it's not very high sum if you compare it with new modern transport projects around the world. As you can see, I didn't mention the projects in China inside the country and outside the country because their investment is 10 times higher. Uh, as it was mentioned, Mediterranean cor uh, Corridor connect East and West and it's more than 3000 kilometers. And it's uh, also based on very strong uh, uh, cross-border uh, exchanges very dynamic ports and vibrant urban nodes. That's why Valencia is so important and play really central role 
in terms of port statistics, in terms important on the railway map, in terms of challenges faced by the urban agglomeration in proximity of the huge port, uh, in the need to accommodate various types of traffic. Currently, the Spanish beneficiaries uh, participate in 115 projects and receive 1.1 billion in Connecting Europe Facility Transport co-funding with overall uh, investments 3.1 billion. Uh, so, I have to say that we see the progress and, con and continuity when it comes to investments along the Mediterranean corridor in the Spain. Gradual upgrade of lines to standard gauge and advanced plans on connecting major industrial hubs uh, to the core network. The stretch between Mur Murcia and Barcelona is an open construction that should soon bring tangible results to optim uh, optimization of railways operations uh, on the Mediterranean uh, corridor. Yes, modern logistics is the part of Spain uh, operations. All these elements makes your network highly sophisticated and challenging from the model shift point of view, but also poorly from the financial perspective. I will come the last year opening of the Vandelos bypass. It was really very important. What is also very important to mention in the context of Valencia, that, uh, that is from this year, the Mediterranean corridor is extended with new sections between Valencia and Madrid and Valencia, Sagunto, Zaragoza as well as adding a motor base of the sea connection in the triangle of Valencia, Palma de Mallorca and Barcelona. All these elements makes your network highly sophisticated and challenging from the model shift point of view, but also poorly from the financial perspective. Uh, Europe continues significantly uh, to upgrade and looking forward of the span, uh, to upgrade of the Spanish rail network uh, to standard European track gauge. In the first phase, many of the sections are in direct proximity of Valencia and its community as ongoing construction concerns to the section between Valencia, Tarragona and Barcelona, as well as the section Castel Bisbal, Nuda uh, Villa Seca. Uh, European Commission directly supported the port of Valencia with adaptations of the internal railway system to the better integrate uh, of the maritime transport to rail railway logistic network. Contributed to the investment between Valencia and Castellon with the open opening of the Vandelos uh, bypass is really important. And last but not least, CEF also supported the standard JH connection of ports of Valencia and Sagunto. Hopefully, all planning is in time. Hopefully, we will use very uh, effectively nine years we are facing because these nine year sh years should be the years of real actions, better communications uh, with uh, communication with public, and last but not least, to have really visible and touchable results. I hope and that we will do all our best, and I hope that you will continue in prog progress like it was really clear for the last years. Thank you very, very much for everything you already have done. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Iveta, for your words and all the information that you gave us. Um, so we have opened the floor for questions for right now because Iveta Radikova has to leave in a few minutes. So one question that we have uh, for you is, um, is has to do actually with the investments uh, from the European Commission in terms of infrastructure, superstructures, control systems and safety systems. This is crucial to develop this um, railway project. So the question is like, is the European Commission going to support the, the railway operators when these services start to implement? Is there any forecast to support the railway operators anyway to um, uh, to increase the, the offer of services? As you know, we are now in new budgetary and period. Uh, and also uh, inside revision of 10T. And what I would like to stress are two important things that uh, I can say yes, uh, as a part of overall um, CEF2 projects, uh, support for infrastructure on railway and logistics and gauge and electrification uh, is the part of the projects. Uh, more, if it is connected directly with the corridor, then it's real part of uh, finances and investment uh, for implementation of the corridor. So, so generally my answer is yes. Thank you very much. And the question that we have here, uses and activities for the next generation mechanism seem to be limited somehow. What would be the areas applicable to the Mediterranean corridor? Hmm. I cannot evaluate uh, directly the preparation um, for the fund of recovery and resilience, it means the new generation uh, projects, uh, because I didn't read the Spanish proposal, it, it is not um, yet agreed at the level uh, of not only European Commission, but also negotiations in between uh, Spain and European co uh, commissions are going on, depends what Spain uh, put inside uh, the national proposal, how to use these sources. But I'm absolutely sure that because of the Green Deal and because of the condition of the portion of the funds, which has to be used for the Green Deal, plus portion which has to be used for digitalization and <laughs> uh, railways uh, are all also the part of digitalization, then <clears throat> if the Spain government put to the fund uh, these priorities, then sure, uh, it's connected and uh, hopefully can be used also for, for hinterland connections to the corridor and plus corridor itself but sorry i had no chance to read the spain proposal Okay, we have no more questions. Thank you very much for your contribution to this webinar. 
And now we will move on to the next uh, intervention by Giuseppe Vicente Boira. The floor is yours, Giuseppe Vicente. If you do not mind my last sentence, thank you very, very much once more. Looking forward for the conclusions from your web seminar. Uh, hopefully you'll send it to us. And we are here to be uh, supportive and to really facilitate your priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivita. Sí, uh, me escucháis, Tomás. Can you hear me? Adelante, adelante, Joseph. Okay, please proceed. Well, thank you. I would like to thank, even though Ibeta must be away, she needs to be excused. She needs to go to the European Parliament for a meeting with the MEPs to speak about the Mediterranean corridor, which shows the interest of the issue at hand and the important scale, which is a European scale. Thus said, I've prepared a presentation that I would like to share with you so that you can better see the ideas. It's a very simple presentation to express some basic ideas about the relationship between the project, the corridor, and Europe. So the first issue I would like to tackle is the celebration that we are holding today, and especially for the chair and the regional consul, consul office for mobility with the regional consular, Arcadi España. Today, I can complain about the interaction of the direct communication with Ms. Radikova with a very dynamic attitude towards the Mediterranean corridor and also the communication with the different regions and the, re the Valencian regional government through Arcadi España's work. Today, I'd like to start by saying that we have three reasons for celebra celebration. First, 2021 is the European Year of Railway Transport. This is great news because, unfortunately, railways, railway didn't play the role that it should have. We are in the uh, very close to a revolution, and I believe so. We are talking about the revolution in transport and shipment. If you told me one to two years ago that planes would be substituted by trains and the transport sector would be liberalized and that the goods, well, this uh, an idea about placing a quota on road transport or rather to find the right balance between transport modes and these means higher opportunities for railway. So 2021, we will see the start of this change that we are witnessing. Secondly, I would like to point out that we hit the 10-year mark of the birth of the European or the Mediterranean corridor, which didn't exist between uh, 2012. And we should mention, mention Ignacy Villalonga's quote in 1918, but it was all dreams until 2011, rather. The Mediterranean corridor was born in 2011 when the European Union decides to recognize the existence of this corridor on the maps and on the documents. So it's 10 years that we celebrate. And then looking elsewhere, I should say that we also celebrating the 160 years of this particular stretch in Valencia. In 1861, we saw the concession of the Tarragona-Valencia stretch 
binding together Catalonia and Valencia's hubs. Both were developing, and we needed this link that was created in 1861. So it's 160 years since then. So it's a good time to reflect upon this reality. Also, in the next slide, is just to, to point out that when we have this hashtag, Quiero Corredor, I want the corridor. This is a movement which is based by the business, the Valencian Business Federation, which has launched this image. Well, we had the idea before, I must say. That was the idea was to explain that the Mediterranean corridor is the Via Justa of the Via Augusta of the 21st century. And well, this is available on our website, Adif, and you will find this hashtag that makes us think that we are on the right track. We are on the right track because throughout history, we've seen these unions, these network visions to structure or to provide a backbone amongst territories. So this is a new Roman Empire, I should say, with the capital city in Brussels. This is a social empire, very different to that of the Roman Empire, but with a similar thinking when, when it comes to that idea. So if Rome 2,000 years ago structured its territory based on a network, a series of needs, But went beyond the zero mile. Now it's Brussels that is creating a similar network. And that's the Trans European Transport Network. So this is not that far off from the Via Augusta. So this territorial logic comes in hand with the political one, which is overcoming barriers. In the first century, that was done through the Roman army and their legions. In 2021, this is done through the European Parliament and through the European institutions, which are overcoming barriers between states that we could see in their transport networks. So, as the original councillor has already pointed out, we are facing new opportunities related to main vectors. First, the deglobalization or the more regionalized globalization. Where the producing hubs and the consumers will be closer. This is an unstoppable trend. The producing hubs and the consumers will get closer, and this will disrupt the log logistical chain. And this impact on this chain will, in turn, have an impact on the needed infrastructures. So if we advance on these macro-regional European structures, we will be at uh, an, ad an advantaged position to find new opportunities arising out of this more regionalized globalization, obviously through businesses, big companies that cannot allow themselves to have a disruption in the chains, as we just see. But we're not just about talking about businesses. We're also talking about people. There are new perceptions, new opportunities. According to a very recent survey by ECODES on railway, these are some of the conclusions. Well, first, the recognitions that the emission, the transport emissions are a problem. More than 80% of citizens of the surveyors think that these emissions pose a problem. And to be honest, I know this is not very much PC, but uh, 
to opening the debate on the uh, toll roads and paying for driving on, their, on our roads is focusing too much on the maintenance costs and not delving into other type of costs being created by the road transport. We are talking about congestion bottlenecks, uh, the accident rate and pollution. So I firmly believe that any rigorous debate on the future of transport and the tariffs and the tolls for roads must also integrate these other elements. Other results, well, frequent travelers would substitute 50% of the airplane uh, First, by trailways, 40% would be, would be interested in traveling over five hours by train, and 61% would would take a night train. And then, very importantly, when it comes to toll roads, and we shouldn't. This is not the right term. Well, a wide majority would support. Uh, a tax on the CO2 emissions. Obviously, this would benefit those ways of transport with no CO2 emissions, such as the railway. So, in order to answer Ms. Radikova when she spoke about the recovery and resilience plan and the future plans for corridors such as the Mediterranean one, I would like to mention this interview with Benito Vicente, director of supply chain of Le, Le, Le Roy Merlin. I like to know what businessmen think about logistics. And if you look, there's a quote I would like to read, where in a sort of revolutionary way, he points out that we've chosen We've chosen even an operator who had a higher cost because regarding the eco-sustainability was more favorable to us. This is a critical factor for us. So I think this is highly relevant as we find businessmen, business people who are choosing more expensive operators simply because they have a more a more sustainable operation from the uh, environment aspect. And this wasn't the case before. Companies just tried to drive down costs, but now they are taking into consideration other types of costs. And if a company such as Leroy Merlin decides that one of the main objectives is to use more railroad, our obligation those of us who are boosting this mode of transport, we need to provide, provide them what, what they are asking for, and that's the railway for their transport. That said, I would now move on to the last bit of my intervention about the recovery and resilience funds and the data in Spain. The, well, the publication of these plans is interesting as this is something totally new. This plan in Spain forecasts to mobilize 6.6 thousand million euros between 2021 and 2026 for the transport corridors. So we have good econ economic perspectives if we, with this fund. Out of 6,600 6.6 .6 billions of euros, uh, nearly 1.9 will go to the 10T network. So for the next six years, we'll have 3,000 million. So I'd like to advocate for the Atlantic Corridor. I think that Spain is doing their homework, developing also the Atlantic Corridor, because the map is changing. It's not the Kilometer, the zero kilometer, uh, let's forget about this, because the 
zero kilometer is not an argument that should be used because the map has fundamentally changed and that's why we have to think of these transport corridors like Mediterranean corridor and uh, Atlantic corridor, 45% of the European funds um, allocated to the sixth component. Uh, then we have also 1.9 billion, 29% uh, are allocated to other actions of the 10T network, then 15%, 800 million will be allocated to the uh, support of digital and sustainable transport because uh, people are asking, are we doing anything with the railway operators? So 800 million are going to be allocated to private companies, well, not 800 million exactly, I'll tell you what, but within this package, a part will be allocated to the private um, railway operators. So within these 800 million, representing 15% of the European fund, 460 million will be allocated in a tender to different companies to adapt their uh, materials uh, to their infrastructures, their wagons, to steam engines, 460 millions to private and public companies in a tender. And um, the next weeks, uh, the call should be ready for this year. So. It's a challenge for these companies because there will be 460 million for them. Within those 800 million, 120 million will go for simple tenders for the eco-incentive sector. And this is a support to the support for the maritime and railway um, transport. So the idea is to incentivate the these modes of transport in compared to the, uh, the road so if you are using the railway instead of using the road you will have a support that's what we want to say and these are the eco incentives so uh, we will not be penalizing uh, those who don't want to, but there will be incentives for those who change to railway transports. And finally, 974 million devoted to intermodality and logistics. So out of these 974 million, I wanted to mention a number of actions included, such as the intermodal terminal of Yagosta in Barcelona or the Fonde San Luis in Valencia station will be benefiting out of these 800 million, 974 million rather, uh, devoted to intermodality and logistics. Also, the um, railway access to the port of Castellón, Escobreras in Murcia and so forth. So having said that, uh, if you have a look at this slide, this is where we are right now. Um, the component number six of this trans, this uh, resilience plant contributes uh, to the ecologic transition in a 76%. So in other words, every 100 euros invested 66 will go to this uh, ecologic transition that we do uh, desperately need. So the role of the European funds right now and the role of Europe is key uh, finishing these uh, corridors. And to conclude, I just wanted to show you this uh, image, this slide um, that shows um, that the Mediterranean corridor is highly geared towards merchandise and goods. 
one of the drives is urban, and the other one is uh, mercantile. Only in between Valencia and the French border, see how many big companies that could benefit from the Mediterranean corridor. And if we go down to Alicante, Murcia, Cartagena, we could even go to um, Cartagena or even Algeciras, which is where the corridor starts. Nobody can deny the importance of the Algeciras port. But today, from the Valencian regional government, look at how many and uh, important companies could be benefiting from this part. So it's uh, obvious that uh, an investment, and maybe we can talk about the urban drive another day, so uh, you can see how important it could be. So with these uh, final slides, I'd like to conclude my my speech, and uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. And I'd like to just mention again this general principle. First, this is a key and strategic moment because of the changes that can happen. Somehow, we'll be recovering this um, European drive of our infrastructures that this regionalized globalization is going to bring us and also the awareness of the citizens in railway transport and finally um, I'd like to focus the importance of the European funds those uh, um, those funds that will go for the Mediterranean corridor and the Atlantic corridor, and not just to the works and infrastructures, but also to the management and support to companies who would like to take part on this reduction of or a more sustainable transport. Thank you, Jose um, Vicente, for your uh, speech. You have combined your own thoughts and you have given us a new information very important about the Mediterranean corridor. I think we have a few questions here from the audience. Uh, for example, um, somebody is telling us that uh, the model, the international intermodal um, uh, station in Sagunto is missing. Uh, are we considering this terminal actually? Well, the intermodal of Sagunto, I'm not sure whether the uh, uh, Mr. Um, Arcadi, um, España, would like to mention this. But yes, definitely, that since um, Sagunto is part of the um, uh, Port Authority of Valencia, it's linked to the destination of the Port of Valencia. But uh, Port Sagunt is a project of the regional government in Valencia. So we're now looking at the different accesses to connect the new Mediterranean corridor and the new logistic area of Park Sagunt 1 and Park Sagunt 2, and also the accesses to the corridor um, Mediterranean, from the Mediterranean to the Cantabric Sea. I think we. In my opinion, we also need a first class uh, intermodality such as it's been for, since the Roman time. So, um, I, in my opinion, I think it's very important. But obviously, this project is part of the Generalitat. I'm not sure if uh, Arkady would like to mention something. Yes, if you allow me, Tomas. Um, Park Sagunt is one of these examples where a situation has been turned, a situation that was uh, uh, jammed or... And I think thanks to different initiatives, the situation is quite positive. All the plots have been sold and we are working on Park Sagunt too. 
I think that uh, the future is the railway, no doubt, and we need that intermodality. And in that sense, the location of Sagunt is uh, strategic, and not only historical, but from present and future connecting the Cantabric axis next to big uh, and powerful industrial areas. And that's why the regional government of Valencia is working. So we need this um, uh, cooperation, public and private, for these intermodal uh, stations. And this would be a priority in the future to have this uh, intermodal station in Sagunto. I understand that we will be able to use the next generation funds to boost this terminal. Yes, of course, we're looking at all these possibilities. I think it falls in into the next generation and that intermodality that Giuseppe Sandboida was explaining, and we are actually working to get some of these European funds. But I think it's key that the private uh, operators also and public ones and in Park Sagunt, I think it's very important. <clears throat> I think there is another question. Uh, how can we promote the logistic operators so that they can move their goods using their railway networks? How can we incentivate this? Well, there are two ways to do that. First, um, that was in my presentation. I think the awareness of the companies that should be incorporating the, um, the environmental uh, costs to their profit and loss accounts. And Leroy Merlon, is all, Leroy Merlin is doing it, and we've seen that in that example. So there is a social pressure in that sense. And uh, there is also another key element uh, and, uh, that I'd like to um, let you know the, to the companies. Their, their products will be better uh, regarded if they are um, sent in a in a means of transport that is sustainable and we know that the um, fruits and vegetables that are being sold we can sell that idea that they are being transported in sustainable means of transport and that's going to be very important in european markets so um, that will increase their value also uh, we know that the, not every country and every company will be able to do so. And a third um, issue is the ECO incentives. I think that proposal will open a new stage on the combined mode of transport. And I think that's the future of transport in Europe combined transport um, doesn't mean to get rid of the truck. It means place the truck on the train when it's needed. So the combined mode of transport and the eco incentives will allow to place those trucks on the trains and the all those trailers um, and the truck will be able to do this last mile transport. So I think that would be very important. The eco incentives will fund the companies that choose to use the railway transport. And we'll be able to see that over the next weeks because it's already there on the sixth component of the resilience plans. And uh, I've also mentioned the capacity. We were talking about Sagunt. Oh, I know that in Sagunt, uh, some producers have their own uh, railway stations, and we've offered them the possibility 
uh, to take part on these uh, benefits so they can adapt to the uh, international coach. They will have to pay a part, but whether if the Spanish government is able to mobilize some resources, this transition will be easier. So to sum up, we have some arguments on the one side uh, that are global and social, and on the other side, we have some economic arguments to produce that transition. Like in any other transition, it might be costly at start, but no doubt it will open a new period in this transport in Spain. Following with Sagunt, they're asking us to let the councillor an idea that apart from the private uh, uh, companies, we have also mentioned that to the authority of the Port of Valencia. That's been also said. Yes, no question about that. The Port of Valencia needs to be a main actor in these types of actions. It's already funding some sections to connect the Mediterranean corridor with the Atlantic corridor and uh, it has to share some of their benefits to improve that inter modality in the uh, projects such as Park of Sagunt. Another question has to do with the way it fits the, the, the corridor, Mediterranean corridor with the with the new um, actions or infrastructures in the city of Valencia, such as the new central station, uh, etc. I think um, this is a subject that um, will keep me busy, uh, me and my and the rest of the team, because we are looking at a this situation that we have to be able to explain. Um, technically as well, and we have to discuss with the general public, which is the change that can uh, undergo the, the 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 network, the railway network in Valencia. We're talking about a network that is from 1957. Um, we haven't actually made any changes there. There's only one tunnel, the tunnel of Serreria, but apart from that, this, uh, we, we have to change and update that network around the city of Valencia. Uh, some time has gone by and we have to reform that element of the infrastructure. So we will uh, present a, a study, a report about the double platform uh, that will go from Valencia to Castellón. And that will revolutionize the city of Valencia in terms of mobility. And I was talking to someone highly relevant in the mobility in Catalonia that visited us in Valencia. When we showed the plans of these uh, uh, changes of the railway, he recognized the deep transformation, uh, positive transformation that um, would uh, have the city of Valencia, uh, for example, there would be a reduction of the road transport, um, maybe uh, suburban trains in the north, uh, improvement of tracks to have a better access to the port of Valencia, maybe a new track that um, would allow to protect the the orchards of Valencia as well. It could help us to free some spaces for the transport of goods and would allow us new um, suburban uh, train stations around Valencia. We have been seeing all these uh, suburban stations disappear. So I don't know, and that's that's a problem. I was comparing this uh, railway uh, infrastructure with the beginning of the uh, 20th century infrastructure. 
And this network was even busier than the current one because we had, for example, the Aragon station that has disappeared. So we have to recover uh, these uh, suburban stations, not closing them. So this is a key element for us. I think a debate will open up a discussion uh, that I hope will be rational about the tunnel and the new platform Valencia Castellón in the following months, maybe after the summer, depending on what the Ministry of Transport tells us, and also if they have finished their informative reports, and we'll be able to talk about in depth about what type of uh, transport model we want. Giuseppe, another question has to do with the, the need to change the railway operation these large uh, investments in infrastructures uh, have this objective, but maybe it's also necessary to modify the network and the logistic uh, companies as well. Uh, it's going to be like that, uh, to be honest, uh, the people in my team say that uh, we are engineers, but we are not um, experts. Uh, I cannot, I cannot actually uh, answer all the technical questions. I'll, we cannot uh, answer, but never mind. Um, I can tell you at present that the public institutions are creating a different network, a new network. And like Ms. Radikova mentioned, uh, we are adapting it to the uh, European intermodality. So we are adapting our um, networks to Europe. And we are pointing out at these investments in public words. And uh, I hope it's uh, today I made it clear that we are going to give support to the private companies, the private railway companies that sometimes they have been uh, complaining that they've been left alone. And, and I know that this is a transition and the situation is complicated, but uh, there will be 460 million, as I mentioned, for these companies to adapt this new situation, open new possibilities, new markets, new opportunities, uh, internal operativity of the uh, railway services will have to change we are talking about uh, low floor wagons. We're talking about uh, fridges in the wagon services connecting the. Um, we're looking at all the different uh, heights um, of the Mediterranean corridor. So the new trains with different heights can actually go through. So all this has to be done with in cooperation with the private sector. So uh, we are always open for discussion with the main companies and also with the smaller companies as well. Uh, more questions uh, about the uh, railway connection of goods between Alicante and Murcia. The question here is, will it be, will be the variant of Torrellano uh, be solved, or are we looking at the coastal uh, variant first? Well, we are quite concerned about that. We have our opinion, um, but the Spanish government has to take the decision, depending on the reports on the railway connections. 
uh, it wouldn't make any sense that the proposed solutions were against a basic principle, which is to promote the good transport, the variant of Torrellano, when it was presented, uh, the project, the cost was extremely high and the um, ministry decided to reevaluate that cost. And right now, I think it depends on the ministry to establish the final uh, solution uh, for this Torrellano variant. But as an office, we are not going to stop um, um, insisting that there needs to be fluidity from Algeciras to France, because that's the future. The railway is the future. And some notes, uh, for example, in the surroundings of uh, Alicante, we might have to take some provisional measures with some provisional investments until the definitive solution is here. This doesn't mean that some of the measures are not going to be reversible. I'm saying that because some people uh, in Alicante are concerned that any measure that uh, consolidates a, a section is going to be irreversible. And that's not true. Sometimes we have to take a step forward and then uh, uh, to have to, we have to take two steps backward. But we are pressuring us and uh, advocating as much as we can so the um, the ministry takes the right decision in the variant of Torrellano. It's interesting to see how there is more awareness by users, by um, clients and also the companies about sustainability and the need of sustainability in in transport and less uh, environmental impact. You mentioned that you are presenting measures to promote these um, yeah, good intentions that can improve the the railway transport. I think that maybe. Uh, we should be using some soft measures in training and uh, dissemination in all levels. This could be highly cost effective and highly benef beneficial because they will be very easy to implement. It would be very cheap and they could reinforce that uh, wave of sustainability that we are right now engulfed in. I completely agree um, with your idea. And actually, what you are doing in the Chair of Transport and Society in the Polytechnical University of Valencia, I think that training and uh, dissemination of knowledges um, action is uh, it's a key element. And I remember when I started to work in the office of the Mediterranean corridor. We have one here in Valencia. And it was um, close to the train drivers of uh, Renfe. And uh, I would listen to them talking about the importance of the sector. And sometimes it was uh, very good to listen to them because they had uh, really interesting ideas. Uh, sometimes they are small changes that improve the network. They would um, talk about the importance of having young people in these activities. And this is something that I'd like to tell the, the counselor that the studies associated to logistics need to be supported by the administration because um, at least they will have a higher demand. Sometimes uh, we cannot in improvise a train driver. We need 
staff that is well prepared for these uh, railway activities. So we are right now on the brink of a change of, uh, of stage. We might have to recycle uh, new staff to the logistical and railway sectors. And this change is very important right now. And I think that is also key to keep this type of webinars because we need to transmit to the society that we need to open up our perspectives and we need to give more oxygen to our discussions. It's very important. And I'd like to thank the Chair of Transport and Society uh, that coincided mostly with the Day of Europe. Uh, so I think it's very, very important what you've done here. I think we are finishing. A last question about the uh, Sagunto Intermodal Terminal to the consular. And the question is, would it be in Park Sagunto? And when could it be operative? Well, this is uh, information is public. And you can see that it would be part in uh, Park Sagunto parallel to the CV309 road. And my technicians always tell me that the sooner, the better. And uh, just a comment to what uh, Josep Isamboira was saying. I completely agree with what you mentioned about the studies of the uh, passing uh, tunnel. The ministry is being sensitive to that. The Generalitat is also looking at the protection of the uh, or the Valencian orchard. We are defending um, the same interests and uh, advocating for them. And we should also mention the eco incentives. In order to facilitate that change that sometimes is not cost effective in the short term for some companies to bring their uh, goods to the railway, um, we know that uh, there are some externalities, such as uh, uh, pollution, that could, um, um, could help them to, if the government is, help, is helping them. I think we should be exploring that, uh, especially looking at the funds that are being to allocated, such as th those ones that Joseph Boyer mentioned. Well, thank you very much for Jose Vicen Boida, coordinator of the Mediterranean, Corredor Mediterranean and Arcadia España, Councillor of Territorial Policy, uh, Public Words and Mobility. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody who listened and connected today to this webinar and everybody who asked the questions on the chat. Thank you and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Thomas. Goodbye.